Disclaimer. In this program, mention is made of the Whisper Dynamic Brace. Dr. Skaggs is a developer of this device. Hello, I'm Bruce Gewirtz, Surgeon in Chief and Vice Dean for Academic Affairs here at Cedar Sinai. And today on our program in Pioneers in Medicine, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce and have a discussion with Dave Skaggs, who is our Chief of Pediatric Orthopedics and one of the world's most renowned spine surgeons. Dave, welcome. Uh, thank you, Bruce. It's a pleasure to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you raised and how did you get interested in medicine? Well, I was uh, born in Boston and then I had to go to the Midwest and spend eight years in speech therapy. So I wouldn't talk with a Boston accent anymore. It's a little uncomfortable getting pulled out of class all the time, wondering why I didn't do as well as the other kids. Uh, then went to school in Massachusetts, medical school and residency in New York at Columbia University. And uh, I ended up marrying a woman who was born and bred in Los Angeles. Uh, her father, Dr. Art Uline, was the original Today Show doctor, so a lot of people recognize him. And I told my wife in the second date, I will never move to LA under any circumstances, but it turned out that the premier pediatric spine surgeon in the world was here in LA, so I came to train with him, and I've never left. And uh, now I'm so lucky to be working at Cedar sinai well, we're, we're lucky to have you here. So uh, you, you trained in orthopedics. Before you went into orthopedics, were you certain you were going into spine surgery or was that just part of the evolution of your training in orthopedics? Yeah, so I didn't decide on orthopedic surgery until I was five. I remember sitting down with my pediatrician and he was saying, these days surgeons could take out a bad knee or a bad hip and put in a new one. And I thought that was so cool from age five on, I just wanted to do orthopedics. And I remember as an intern on the orthopedic service, I watched scoliosis surgery. And I watched this poor deformed girl made straight in just a few hours. And I left the operating room telling the residents, that's what I wanna do for the rest of my life. And I've never wavered. And today I did a scoliosis case. And every time I do it, I think I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I have the coolest job in the world. Well, it certainly makes a huge impact in people's lives because young people are obviously so sensitive to their appearance and how they're viewed by others. How does scoliosis occur? I'm sure it's a uh, it's been around since uh, since humans started to walk upright. Uh, what are the what are the mechanisms by which scoliosis occurs? Yeah, to be perfectly honest, nobody knows. It's genetic. There's over 40 genes that interact and cause scoliosis. There's a lot of ongoing research, but so far we just don't know. Where the hopeful research is now is, you know, how to treat scoliosis better. So if you think about orthopedics, there is no joint in the body left that we fuse except for the spine. So if you have a hip that's bad with arthritis or a knee that's bad with arthritis, you get a new joint that moves, except for the spine. The spine is still being fused. So I predict in the future that there will be more operations that preserve motion in the spine. And here at Cedars sinai Spine Center of Excellence, we probably do as much joint preservation surgery as anyone in the country. Um, so instead of fusing everybody's neck and lower spine, a lot of the surgeons here are replacing uh, the bad discs with mobile discs. So it's my uh, perception, and maybe way back in my own medical school days, that, that young women are more frequently affected with scoliosis than men. Is it a hormonally based um, problem? Yeah, you're absolutely right. For every 10 teenagers with scoliosis that require some treatment, nine are female. And it's kind of at an unfortunate time of their lives because it's just as they hit the adolescent growth spurt that all of a sudden they don't want their parents to see their bodies. And then they often show up with a great big hump on their back. And also there's a great big hump on their chest because scoliosis is not just a sideways curvature, but the whole thorax twists. And although that's the bad part, the good part is we can fix that. Uh, we now have tools that allow you to completely untwist not only the spine, but the thorax. And the girls afterwards look in the mirror and hold their chest and start crying and say, wow, I didn't know you could fix my chest. 
And at first I said, wow, I didn't know I could either. Uh, because, you know, orthopedic surgeons don't look at girl's chest. But it turns out that we really can take someone who is, I hate to use the word deformed, um, but that's the way people often see themselves in the mirror. And you can really let them leave the hospital two inches taller with a near, near normal appearance so that they can be surfing around the beach and nobody would even know that they had scoliosis. So the, the curvature of the spine occurs at a specific prepubital or pubital time and it's totally normal before that? Generally, yes. For adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, it happens in idiopathics. Now, there's also a whole different form of scoliosis that happens in infants. And the problem in infants is it's all about the lungs. Because if you fuse a spine straight in a two-year-old, the x-ray looks good, but the chest never grows and the child dies early. So we now have fairly newly uh, innovative tools that will allow the spine to grow without surgery. It's done by magnets. Uh, so when kids have early onset scoliosis, you place these magnetic rods, they come back to your office as frequently as every six weeks, and magnetically you just keep lengthening and lengthening and lengthening them. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. So if you could identify in, in the more typical form of late, later onset scoliosis, if you could identify early on that there was a deformity beginning, will that allow you, or does it allow you, to treat them less invasively, uh, or, or does it progress irrespective of what you do? Oh, precisely. You're right. Now I know why you're surgeon in chief. Yes, so if we're able to identify the kids early before they need surgery, the traditional treatment is a brace to help prevent the spine from getting worse. Now the truth is the brace is this big, hard plastic thing. Kids really don't like it. And it only saves about one in three kids from surgery. Genetics are stronger. Now, Cedars-Sinai is fortunate to be the very first medical center in the country that is making available uh, to a clinical population new braces. They're called the Whisper Brace. So the Whisper Brace is not a hard plastic brace like every brace has been for the past, you know, literally 50 years but it's something dynamic that will push on the spine, allow the patients to bend over, touch their shoes, do sports. And the National Science Foundation is given a $1 million grant to start putting pressure sensors in these braces. So as you push the spine straight and the pressure wears off, we know it on our cell phone and it's time to change out the brace and push a little bit harder. So there is hope that when we see scoliosis early on, we could prevent surgery. Wow, so it's sort of like a, a move toward a dynamic brace uh, that would change in its configuration uh, based on the patient's activities. Yeah, you're unbelievable. That's what we call it. It's called a dynamic brace. So it's a dynamic brace, not just for scoliosis, but I think it's going to become very popular with people who have bad postures. You know, leaning forwards is called kyphosis. Um, I think, you know, half of the mothers of teenagers in the country are concerned that the kids are leaning over more, as are half of the 60 and 70 year olds in the country. And if we have a brace that you could maybe put on for 20 minutes a day and could slowly change the shape of your spine, I think that it could really have a huge impact in this country. That's, that's really fascinating. So in the treatment of, of what, for lack of a better term, sort of a, a standard scoliosis patient uh, who, who develops scoliosis in and around the pubertal time. Uh, you intervene based on a certain angle criteria. And if you do so, how many times does such a patient require uh, some type of intervention? Yeah, so precisely, if a curve reaches 20 to 25 degrees and there's still growth, that's when we talk about bracing. And if it reaches 40 to 50 degrees, roughly 45 to 50 degrees, uh, then surgery is generally considered because at that point, it's like the leading tower of Pisa, the mechanical forces take over and it will get worse for the rest of their life. So the whole game is if we can keep the curve under 45, we can prevent the need for surgery. So, so um, obviously uh, back pain is a, is a ubiquitous symptom uh, for grownups uh, I hardly know any of my friends uh, that doesn't have uh, some degree of back problems. Uh, is back pain prevalent in children? Yes, and it didn't used to be. 
So when I trained in residency, you were taught if a child has back pain, get an MRI, it's an emergency, they have cancer. And that's just not the case anymore. About 50% of 15 year olds have back pain. And it's becoming so ubiquitous that I'm afraid people are starting to write off back pain in teenagers. Now the truth is a lot of our athletes literally have broken spines. Uh, the athletes who work the hardest and who play through pain are getting overuse injuries, which often consist of stress fractures of their spines. And I see children all the time that literally have broken spines that are being told it's all in your head and go to physical therapy. Uh, so I'd make a plea to people out there listening. If you have a teenage athlete that is complaining of more and more back pain over the years, please have them seen by a pediatric spine specialist. No, it's, it's very interesting. And uh, if, if you um, have your scoliosis corrected as a child and it's corrected in a highly effective way, is the greatest likelihood that for the rest of your life you would never need another spine operation? Yes. It almost sounds too good to be true, but we really have 50-year follow-up now on the original Harrington rods. And as long as there is enough open discs at the bottom, say that you have a disc under L3, L4, and L5, you have three discs at the bottom to allow for some motion and some shock absorption, then the studies show you're just nearly the same as the average human in terms of back pain. You know, you could have a full life, you could play sports, you could have babies, you could have epidural. Um, spine surgery for scoliosis works surprisingly well. And what would you say are the biggest advances? I, I'm aware of the, the neuro monitoring you do. I'm aware of some of the complex imaging you do. But during your remarkable career, what do you think have been the biggest changes in your specialty? Well, honestly, the ability to monitor the spinal cord real time during surgery is probably the number one thing that has made scoliosis surgery safe. Um, so in the old days, if you straightened a spine, somebody might wake up paralyzed and you would have had no idea. And if we think about when our brain says, kick my foot, how does it get there? It's electricity. Electricity jumps, runs up and down. The spinal cord is kind of like a wire. So now during surgery, we can measure the electricity run up and down the spine. And if in the middle of surgery, after we straighten the spine, it stops working, we can reverse what we did. And at least in my career, 100% uh, of the time, the signals would come back and the child would wake up with some movement. Um, so surgery has become vastly more safe because we can monitor the spinal cord. And in terms of the imaging, do you ever make 3D models of the spine prior to uh, repairing it? Absolutely. And I was at the Cedars sinai Surgical Simulation Center for the first time last week. That's amazing. So scoliosis surgery is very complex three dimension and if we can print something out and have it in our hands and even sterilize it and have it in the OR I think that allows us to visualize the spine better and at Cedar sinai we have such fantastic use of intraoperative CT scans that we're able to see real time from three dimensions and move an image in front of us you know where we are working and where it's safe. And so many areas of surgery have have gone to somewhat minimally invasive approaches. Uh, how does that translate to spine surgery? Yes, yeah, so I'd say Cedars Sinai Spine Center is one of the world leaders for minimally invasive surgery. Um, and I have to admit, I'm learning from the, the surgeons here every day. So it used to be done through, you know, say a five inch incision and take three or four days in hospital, you know, can now be done as same day surgery and somebody could go home the same day with a one inch incision. So I think it's really become less invasive with no decrease in safety. If, if I have scoliosis and uh, I have a child, is that child more likely to have scoliosis than someone who, who has not had it as a parent? Yeah, but just barely, only one in 100. So the average kid is one in 1,000. The child of a parent who has it is only around one in 100. And do yeah. these genetic factors, have, are they multi-gene uh, combinations? Yeah, it's over 40 genes. It's far too complex for an orthopod to understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I doubt if that's true. So what's been the, the single most satisfying element of your uh, career? I mean, what is it that, that you think is, uh, is, is, the, is the key thing uh, that, that 
brings you back with such great enthusiasm to your uh, operative work? Well, I mean, strictly from my career as a surgeon, um, it has to be taking these kids who are in pain physically from a broken spine or they feel deformed and returning them to normal. Uh, but more and more, my greatest joy is training younger surgeons and building elite teams of surgeons and nurses and scrub techs and realizing very humbly that a surgeon by themselves is useless. I'm a useless person just by myself. But if I'm with a team of people, we can do amazing things. So I'd say my greatest joy now is building the team of many different specialists working together with the common mission of providing the best care possible to patients. Well, that sounds uh, really good and really inspiring. And Dave, it's, it's been delightful to have you here uh, to speak to today. Thank you for inviting me.